Hi students, it's Amanda Burbage, your Humanities 246 instructor, and I wanted to make you a quick video with one thing that's on my mind and two things that are going to help you with upcoming assignments. First, I want to talk about something I've noticed in the news lately, and that is that our unit on perception and language is really working hard for us because if you pay attention to the news, you'll see there are a few stories that are popular right now, and I have noticed specific language use that is troubling to me, specifically uh, with the February 14th mass shooting in Parkland, Florida. Uh, some of the language use around the shooter uh, was somewhat empathetic and um, softening, kind of explanatory of his behaviors, which I hope everybody would agree his behaviors have no reasonable explanation. Um, and this is troubling to me because it creates a framework from which people begin solving problems. And don't get me wrong, you know I think that solving problems is a good thing. We spent a whole unit on it. But when we frame a problem in a certain way, solutions are then discovered in a certain way. So let me take a sidetrack example here. If I tell you that the problem is that the parking lot is too small where I work, then the solution is, drum roll please, make the parking lot bigger. But that may not actually be the best solution. If I say that the problem is there are not enough people carpool, then Suddenly the solution is let's incentivize carpool or let's make it easier for people to find a way to ride share. Um, so the language we use around framing the problem often leads to the solution. And that brings us back to my original example. When we frame the problem of gun control in the um, terms of those who would support um, heavy regulations for guns, or if we frame it in terms of those who would be against regulations for guns, then the solutions will follow from those perspectives. And when we talk about um, guns only in the hands of the mentally ill, well, then that focuses us only on solutions related to um, mental illness. Now, what you'll see is that then people start dividing. And because of their division, they go into their separate corners and don't necessarily continue to talk about how uh, their so solutions might overlap, or at least their solutions might not be exclusive. So in fact, we could solve the problem of guns related to um, education, related to um, control and regulation, related to mental health, related to um, toxic male culture or bullying culture. So we could actually have solutions in all of those areas and not necessarily have to pick one. But unless we use language that helps us get to that, it's really hard to arrive at that because as you know, there's a big difference between discussion and talking and uh, we would need to discuss these items. And unfortunately, when we retreat to our corners, we end up only talking past each other. So that's something that's been on my mind and this is not the only example. I think you can also see interesting uses of language related to other things. For example, the bombings in Austin, how the bomber was discussed in certain terms that we probably would not have used had he been a foreigner or had he been someone who practices Islam. Also, I think we're seeing some interesting language use around the Stormy Daniels issue with President Trump. Whether you believe her or whether you believe him or if you think the truth is probably somewhere in between, um, the way that we frame this conversation has been really interesting for me uh, from a sociological and language use standpoint. Okay, now that's what's on my mind. Thanks for indulging me. But I want you to know that these things, I want them to be on your mind too, because everything we talk about in this class really relates to real life. And you may not be a news junkie, that's fine, but you should be paying attention to how words are used in your workplace and in your family and in your neighborhoods and in your places of worship and all around you, how those words affect the way that we think about the circumstances that we're in and the circumstances of others. All right, so two things that are gonna help you with your upcoming assignments. Number one, in just a few days, you have your argument construction assignment. This assignment is just kind of a taste of uh, how an argument is built, and my hope is that you'll really um, have an opportunity to exercise your creative thinking because these statements that I've given to you for uh, use of construction often are ones that wouldn't be ones you would agree with. So I would encourage you to try and at least pick one of the two uh, that you'll use for your assignment to be something you disagree with and really stretch your ability to see the argument um, from the other person's point of view. 
And remember that you can only use personal evidence for one uh, of each of the sets of examples. And that's the biggest problem I see from student work is that they typically uh, use personal evidence more often than they should. And the other problem I get from student work is not using at least one academic reference. And we just spent some time learning in the information literacy module about what an academic reference is. So go back to that module and uh, discover how you can look into the library database for an academic reference in a peer reviewed journal so that you can support at least one of your claims related to your argument construction. And the reason we do that first is because then you'll see it in your next assignment, which is the debate analysis. I've given you a set of videos. Please do not wait until the last minute to watch these videos because I think the students who do the best at this assignment are the students who at least watch their video more than once. Because the first time you watch it, you're kind of taking it all in. And then the second time you watch it, you're able to pick on um, a few different details that you might have missed especially when it comes to language use and argument framing and things that you find particularly compelling or uh, not at all relevant. And you know that what I'm saying is true because you remember from unit two, we have selective attention. We can't take everything in at all the time. We only are able to kind of process what we're able to apply our attention to. And when, even though we're receiving all kinds of input, we're only able to process the input that we have our brain power kind of dedicated to. So all of these elements of the units are kind of coming together. Another great reason to start early is so that you can take advantage of the extra credit opportunities. I find that students who go to the Writing Center to earn those extra credit points actually end up earning a letter grade or higher on their assignment. Now, the biggest problem with the debate analysis that I see students make is that they spend their entire paper convincing me that they're right. Now, I do love you, but I want you to know that your opinion in this project does not matter. I don't care if you agree or disagree with the people who are speaking in the debate. Your job in this project is not to necessarily form a fully formed opinion or change your mind. Your job is to really pay attention to the art of argument, to the art of debate. Because what I want you to do is two things. One, discover the tools that are really useful in debate and argument. And then two, start recognizing where you are most vulnerable to those tools. So for instance, if you'll pay attention to some of the language use that some of the debaters will use, you'll hear a story or a statistic that you might find extremely compelling and then you would know wow i'm really vulnerable to stories or statistics and then that makes you better prepared to think critically when you are faced with other issues in your workplace in your home life and um, of course at school too so thanks for giving me your time for this video and get in touch if you have any questions